Хорошо, давайте. So, let's start. And thank you for everyone to be in the festival. We will start our first uh, discussion on the future of the war movement. So, please, we have Sasha Starost talking from talking from Tbilisi in distance and then uh, we have also another speaker which was not in the program Gosha which is representing Antifund initiative Sasha will be representing feminist uh, anti-war resistance so please start I will try to do a simultaneous translation yeah. okay Sasha da so thank you everyone i'm not completely oriented about the format of the event but i'm involved in several initiatives one of them is the feminist anti -war resistance and i'm participating to very particular things in the feminist anti -war resistance i'm in the giving uh, mental support for people uh, yeah. so i'm sasha starost i'm an artist activist so i'm involved in the artist project and also before the war i was involved in the artist project and I'm participating in the feminist anti-war resistance, and I'm responsible of the of the um, direction of mental support and and kind of psychoactivism. Yeah. So I'm doing this psycho aspect of the feminist anti-war movement. And I yeah, and I have just a couple of words. What is the feminist anti-war resistance in general? And then I go to big in the details because that is what I will I'm doing myself. And in my opinion, it's very important part. I also will talk about my own activities because it's an important part of the anti-war movement in the general. So feminist anti-war movement is a grassroots uh, uh, network of activists. It was set up immediately after the beginning of the war by activists and it was originally a horizontal structure and it was the idea that whoever can join the feminist anti-war resistance if there is interest to do that but obviously there has to be some security screening and I was before war I was very much involved in the su supporting people with mental issues and this was a big part of my feminist activism. So this is why I got in involved in this uh, aspect of mental support. So I was working as a therapist, but also involved in this uh, psychoactive movement, which was the first uh, kind of self-advocacy group of people with mental issues. And I also personally have uh, experience in the world, in, in my life with uh, mental issues. So we joined this feminist anti-war movement to set up this uh, psycho aspect of psycho direction or or sector of the movement. We have a we have a pool of of psychologists who are working with the particular cases. So last last five years, I'm involved in the activism, artivism, and social arts. And today I'm presenting two projects in the framework of the feminist anti-war resistance. I'm a member in the feminist anti-war resistance from the March. And I'm involved in the psychological support section of the feminist anti-war movement. And I will tell in general about the structure of the feminist anti-war movement because the psycho movement it's only not support uh, this support to activists but it's also in general direction which is needed in the society which is traumatized by war and violence why i'm involved in this psychological aspect it's because i was involved in this problem continuously in my life and i am a synchron translator and also I was one of the first people who set up in Russia this platform 
for self-advocacy of people with the mental issues. It's basically self-organization of people with some mental issues. And when the feminist anti-war resistance was set up, I started this mental support section. And we have involved several psychologists to give support with people who have some problems with mental issues or trauma. And there are very different people who are contacting us. Occasionally also Ukrainians are connecting us. People who are contacting us, we are directing them to our pool of specialists. Besides that, that we try to support people, we are also publishing some brochure with initiatives so that people could work with this uh, theme of, of mental support. We made also a series of streams, which was also checking experience of the war, also from point of view of sociology, culturology and psychology, which in my opinion is very important to get the general picture, so that we didn't had need to focus on just one certain point. And it's actually very important, also, and also for the anti-war movement it's very important, so that people also didn't get problems with the burnouts. So we are working with very good social problems and social groups and volunteers from most different directions, and also supporting people who want to leave Russia. We are working with the Soldiers' Mothers Organization. We need a big uh, support for also for women who don't want that they are since are being sent to the war. So also we are, in, we are talking with all the kinds of people whose life was destroyed by the mobilization, also like parents and relatives and how, in general, to fight against this repressive system. So, why this mental advocacy is so important as part of the general anti-war movement? So, a few words about the feminist anti-war resistance, which was uh, set up by several people, but there are many feminists. There are public known feminists, also non-known feminism. It's a big structure, and uh, in order to join us, one has to go through the verification, some security checks, and we also some trainings with the security. And after this, people can be voluntary in our movement. And whoever can join our materials and cards and plaquettes as they consider necessary. There are several directions of work. It's quite known. Most known aspect of our world is the street actions that we are doing, but it's not the only thing. We also sometimes help people to leave the country. We are giving mental support. We are distributing several initiatives. Also, we were gathering money for generators in Ukraine, and we are supporting Ukraine and Russia. But most of this is a bit invisible, because mostly we get attention only when we make actions. So, we, it's a quite a big structure, this feminist anti-war movement, which is doing different initiatives. Anti-repressive work, also cooperation with the soldiers, mothers organization, the mental support organization. And so I'm in responsible of, of just one of the initiatives of this mental support initiative, but I cannot tell in detail with all the respect. But now I will talk more about this mental advocacy aspect. We have several paradox in activism. So active, there are se several aspects, directions of work. And um, so now I will tell more about this mental advocacy work. Okay. So there are many activists, everyone is working without uh, wage. And activists are basically, it's also the situation before war, that activists have to do work in the areas what the state is basically not taking care. So. So we have lots of contact with people, lots of work with uh, people who have some traumas and also people who have burnout problems. So people have this impression that they are living in a completely hostile society. So we at, at least try to decrease the harm that the state is being causing. So there are all the time repressions. 
and repressive laws. And all of this, of course, is uh, also influencing the mental state of the participators of the moment. But people also often cannot, don't know how to help themselves. And before war, it was often just people had the burnout problems. But now the situation is even worse, because people are all the time in the stressful situation and uh, burnout situation, and people also might uh, start to lose focus, and there might be some important tasks that people cannot do, and especially people who are staying in Russia. It's, uh, they are in the very hostile environment, and all the time, the state is looking after these people and trying to get rid of them. So activists, it's important to have a constant access to mental support. So why it's this mental support is one kind of weapon in our struggle. In general, in the whole Russian system, there is huge amount of mental problems that are not being reflected. And when happened a massive mobilization, and people who are joining the war crimes and came from some cities, and someone should work with the people who are traumatized from the war. In the whole society, kind of turbulence is growing in the society. And it's possible that as a result of all this violence, there might be kind of a civil war. And all, all of this social, uh, social, all of this, all of this social issues, they can just grow and grow. And this was even before the mobilization, but after the mobilization, just everyone is being mobilized and also very young people. Many have already died. There are people who have families and they have mothers. And the mothers of the mobilized, they try to organize some sort of anti-war movements. And all of these people need some sort of mental support. And it's a huge structure and not only about Putin. And these people should be in some, maintain their mental health. People who, who would be able, even for people to be able to mobilize, they need to have a good mental state. And all of the scale of the problems in Russia is of course huge. And this, this, these problems of people going to war and returning from the war, it's of course a huge problem, but we had to pay attention to this more. So last thing I wanted to say about the mental support, is that, that if people are familiar with our framework, many people are involved in the propaganda, and to get directly to these people who are victims of the propaganda, it's often difficult to contact with them. But we have to find mechanism to work with people who are under influence of the propaganda. And it's also sometimes not safe to contact with people. And years of propaganda have been make causing some effect, so it's not so easy to talk with these people, but we have to find ways. And the soldiers' mothers, they are trying to contact people under influence of the propaganda. So we try to find them ways to reach out to people who are in general completely close to us. And in the end of my talk, there are lots of discussion what are the limits, who should we cooperate and who should we not cooperate. And I think it's a bit naive to discuss, so maybe someone who is voluntarily going to war, it's not possible to discuss. But we have to work with soldiers' mothers and also soldiers who are mobilized and also conscript because there is ch chances to get these people out from the war. And we think it's very important and useful to try to create these kind of networks. Okay, thank you. Maybe we have another introduction. So I will be telling about the project Antifund. It's a shorthand about anti-war fund. It's a common project of several grassroots initiatives. And yeah, anti-job, anti-war sick leave and the feminist anti-war resistance. Oh. Anti-war, feminist anti-war resistance and um, anti-war sick leave, they are new initiatives. Anti-job uh, is existing already for many years. Uh, and anti-job, anti-job, 
So at the fund uh, is supporting uh, wage workers who have had some problems because of their uh, anti-war position, and also and also is uh, defending the workers' rights in the condition of the war and crisis, and also is discussing tactics of the working uh, working class resistance. And we also consider that it's kind of creating infrastructure of some possible future workers' protests. And for this, we created a small uh, strike fund and also tried to create the structures of scaling in, in case there will be a bigger protest. And we are sure that these conflicts in around the war and the uh, degradation of level of life, it will bring conflicts also in the sphere of the workplaces. And, in, uh, and we also think that these protests in the degradation of the level of life, they should have find a, like a political, also an anti-war aspect. So, and this was created in the March of last year, the, the project was established. Yeah. And at that point it was already obvious that the existing anti-war movements, they didn't manage to enlarge, make a, make a wider social basis for their activity. And the uh, problem was that it was not only that, also the protests were in, in the problems because police was not only before the protest uh, attempting to arrest the suspected organizers, but also people who were joining the, the protest in the streets. Yeah. And people even couldn't uh, gather in the larger groups to create uh, some, inf some protests, but they were just split into smaller groups. And in the course of all the protests, yeah, yeah, and in the course of all the protests in Russia, there were more than fifteen thousand people uh, detained. So, in the context of the protests and the mass protests, the mass arrests, and there was a big uh, collapse of the Russian economy. So, in, and immediately the ruble was dropped to hundred rubles a dollar, which was seventy before the before the war. And uh, workers were being laid off. Also, products uh, disappeared from the shops. And there was expected. Everyone said that there will be a very big economic crisis in Russia. So, in just a one day, 19th of April, in in Novosibirsk, uh, there was a strike of the bus drivers. Uh, Ozon is uh, is is online. Uh, Ozon, which is uh, online biggest online magazine in Russia, they got. Uh, hundreds of workers. Also in uh, Kaluga, which is a, fact a factory, they stopped uh, stopped uh, setting up the, the cars, like stopped. Uh, and because of this, there was a big uh, fall of, of production all over the Russia. And also in the Yaroslav, the bus drivers didn't have to work because their, uh, because their uh, wages were, were uh, not paid. So in Yuzhno Sahalinsk, in, in the Far East, there was also a strike, but I, I couldn't hear the details. Ah, so in Tveri, the Yandex taxi drivers, which is the same as Yango in Finland, they also made a strike. Uh, also General Motors is stopping their deliveries and, and expelling their workers. And this is just, uh, and this was just news from uh, one single day. And also many expert organizations, they were they were saying that there will be a completely collapse of the Russian economy, like, for example, the World Bank said that the Russian economy will collapse around 11%, lost uh, around 11% of the GDP during one year. And as a comparison in the 90s, when there was 1998, there was a big uh, defaulting of the debts and an economic crisis, which basically resulted change of the power in Russia and the Putin came to power. The gross domestic product only was falling a, a bit more than 5%, so it's two times less than it's what is now predicted. And in the 1992, when the Soviet Union collapsed, the economy fell 14%. So people were waiting for a very big economic crisis. So the initiative was going to be around economic problems and we were expecting that economic issues could result growth of the anti-war movement. And we believe that the whole anti-war movement and um, op oppositional movements, they, could, they should uh, try to find out some uh, 
how to say crossing or contact or growing out to more kind of social protestant sphere <laughs> and this kind of reaching out for wider audience is one of the way could be the the way of economic uh, problems with normal people and this could be some conflicts in the working working place and work, yeah, workplace contacts can grow to be strikes and strikes are one of the most effective uh, ways to struggle against the situation in Russia yeah, and, and we believe it was important to raise this aspect because the whole opposition in Russia it's a bit uh, like has this kind of it uh, as often a liberal character and it doesn't always remind people of the striking as aspect of the workers protests even if in this general general like latest histories in russia the striking has played a very important part in the social movements and also both in in russia and in the general uh, soviet uh, space and for example, also in 2080s, the strikes played a big part and there was a huge general strike all around the capital city Yerevan in Armenia four years ago. And also these events in Kazakhstan last uh, winter, last winter, they also started originally from worker strikes. And also we should keep in mind the Belarusian protests, which were really huge. There were a big number of strikes. In, in many companies, but eventually the authorities managed to put down this movement. Yeah, maybe these problems in Belarus, it was because people who were organizing the street protest, they were not really ready or capable to organize problems in the working places. And this might be one of the reasons of the failure there. And to get... And for this... Um, in order to get uh, by this gap between the existing anti-war movements and the workers' movements, we created the anti-fund uh, together with the feminist anti-war resistance and, and other initiatives. And because of this, yeah, we created this anti-fund and we're making some mechanism how to increase this fund also from uh, different countries and how to, we can inside the Russia to pass this movement to people who are doing some things in the workplace against the war. And we are providing uh, legal support for people who ended up to problems in the working place because of the anti-war position. And there were people who were receiving warnings and also people were sacked for anti-war positions and joining anti-war actions. And also biggest pressure was in people in the education sector for against the teachers because the government wants to use them as a propaganda tool to spread uh, war propaganda. So when people were uh, contacting us and needed support. We were contacting them with people who need uh, legal help. And also if people were interesting to go in public we were also so giving them support uh, to spread information about the problems they got okay. so yeah yes yeah, so, so yeah it's just also people who were being sacked we were providing them them some legal help to, to fight against this also yeah, in the different uh, private firms just uh, the manager started to by different uh, by putting pressure on or other illegal means to sack people from the work and we were providing them with some support so and we think that people shouldn't just go agree to go out but people should resist and we were providing various means of support for people who ended up to this situation and this way we try yeah. and this way we try to also find out to new people who are outside the current anti-war movement and find new new ways to organize so yeah in the beginning we organize it's not possible to organize a strike in online we try to have another kind of contact with people and people only only people who know each other can uh, are ready to 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 fight together 
and we think that uh, and we should be prepared for this kind of situation and anti-war movement should develop infrastructure and preparedness for this kind of protests. And this way we also managed to reach out to people outside the traditional activist, activist uh, circles. And uh, this whole war, war uh, machine started to hit people from all the different spheres of life. For example, in May and, and June, we were seeing more uh, problems in the, with the doctors. Because doctors and healthcare personnel, they were forced to, to go to Ukraine in uh, in the war area and obviously many of them didn't want to go there and we had to find ways to provide them with some legal support not to do that but uh, kind of what happened eventually is that uh, at this point at least the economic situation in russia has stabilized and biggest role in this was for because of the russian export of the different uh, fossil fuels and actually actually during the, during the year the russian budget has been having a record uh, amount of revenues and because of this the russian rubble got much more stronger and uh, and the cost of dollar it went down to 60 rubles or even under and this economy started to stabilize and this also influenced uh, the working workplace relationships and also russian state they consider this workplace protest extremely dangerous and and also that it's kind of weak spot they understand themselves that uh, this is the weak spot of the regime and because of just ktos so yeah so because of this the state itself started to create some sort of support uh, funds for uh, workers which who have uh, been who have uh, problems and also they for they were forbidding entrepreneurs to sack workers so there is for example people are not anymore doing work but they are formally in in the working place and they for example can uh, propose them some ad additional qualifications or some additional uh, small uh, small uh, jobs with some kind of income so and because of this the official unemployment rate in russia it was not not even growing but actually it was falling to 2.10 percent and there is also some expect says that this unemployment rate in russia is a historical minimum it's never been so small but then uh, what happened next is that the mobilization started to also influence the working place relations and russian state actually russian state russian state has actually quite a strong cooperatist aspect so and like actually the economy is quite strongly controlled still by the state and which some businesses and areas have preferential treatment and so on and this mobilization is actually used by the state to solve uh, some uh, social uh, problems and for example when when the state needs more pe more people going to the ballots they are ordering the enterprises to send their workers to vote and then uh, the bosses start to do different kind of things to have more people voting. And also during the COVID epidemic, the vaccinations and kind of uh, putting more pressure for people to take vaccination, it was organized in uh, the working places. And only because of this uh, using, pr using the management in the private companies, they managed to get uh, some results with this uh, vaccination campaign and reach the goals they had uh, put the the vaccination coverage they had uh, attempting to reach and mobilization also is is uh, following a similar pattern according to the war the, each company should maintain a list of of the um, the workers who are in the military reserve and when the um, mobilization was was announced so basically the military officers they were contacting the contacting the private companies and what uh, we were proposing and we were spreading uh, propaganda for people uh, then not, not to go to work during the following two or three weeks and for example to take a sick leave during the time of the mobilization and even if if it's more or less normal m workplace that is not going to send uh, help the military to get uh, more people drafted there is a risk that on your way to work uh, you can be still uh, caught by the army and sent to the war 
And we also set up a feedback mechanism that people who are joining our call, this, our calls for the sick leaves, that they could, uh, to, so that we get some general idea how many people are joining this. So this our call to take a sick leave during the mobilization, it spread quite widely in different social media. And we got all the times, all the kinds of messages from people who joined all around the country. And we, we were establishing contact with these people. So we were contacting people back and uh, asking questions that how the war has influenced their working place and uh, the situation in their working place and what do people think about the war. So, so this information we got, it was ne maybe necessary, like completely original, because there were also other kind of this kind of um, research on attitudes of the workers. And these people often from um, Moscow and St. Petersburg, they were writing to us that the most all of, everyone in this workplace is against the war. And then people from more distant places in periphery and who have older people working in their workplace, they said that they had more people supporting the war. But we also got, for example, in the Leningrad region, which is area around the St. Petersburg, we got messages from people who are working on the railways, like comp companies which are providing uh, providing uh, equipment for the railways. They were contacting us, and because there were lots of quite young people, and they were immediately influenced by the mobilization, and it influenced their their attitude towards the war. And we got in feedback. According to this feedback, we got this uh, mobilization is actually has a big effect on uh, people's attitudes uh, towards the war. And also, we got some some uh, stories of people who are in some working in some small cities which have been built around the nuclear power stations in Russia. And this. Uh, People who are living in these places, they are poor, but they try to avoid uh, the mobilization. Many people try to avoid the mobilization by any means and also also hiding from the authorities. And uh, in this situation, in these nuclear power plants, in uh, they didn't have in enough workers to do some uh, dangerous tasks, which you, according to law, has to have a certain amount of people involved was also a story of one woman fr from a small uh, city in the eastern uh, Russia. And she was telling about the discussion in the city social media. And in the very first uh, days of the war, there was some people put videos to social media from the city of the guys who were going to the war. And in the comments, people were putting messages like wishing them luck and so on. But then at some point people started to write critical comments and also anti-war comments and mobilization and even were criticizing the church which was according to them breaking the principles and after this people were didn't put these videos anymore and yeah this was interesting uh, experience for us because we could get out from this bubble of the activist activist circles and because, uh, yeah, with these contacts with these uh, this, uh, workers in, in different uh, areas, we could uh, bit widen our perspective to things that were happening around us. And we could get the contacts of people from all around Russia. And we are still in contact with these people and uh, get asking how is it going on in their areas. And this way we got uh, some understanding what's going on on in the country above just the news and we also made instructions on how how or some in, in information how in the during the mobilization some managers started tried to get uh, more money out for the needs of the company from the workers and the, for example the no sorry Previous was mistaking this was how the government tries to get money out from the companies to their own needs. For example, in some regions, the the government started to trying to squeeze out money from the companies to provide uh, some needed uh, resources for the soldiers. So they were basically just trying to 
gather some uh, sort of voluntary, but in actually not so voluntary donations from the workers to the military. And this is another problem on which we were working. We were writing guidelines how to how to avoid this kind of forced uh, stealing of your money. And we are also waiting for the new wave of the mobilization, which is quite likely to happen. And we are also expecting increase of repressions in Russia. Еще раз скажи. Ah, ah, so repression, economic, eco, eco, da, econo, so it means not repression, but also economic uh, depression. Economic recession. So, uh, recession or, or depression, yeah. Recession. Recession. Mm. He said that we are all fine. Uh, yeah. Yeah, mm. yeah. So... In this year, the Russian state managed to avoid the economic collapse, but this is likely to happen this year or the next year. It's uh, also because many of the sanctions, they started to be effective only end of the last year or, of, or beginning of this year. And also there is uh, some negative dynamics also in the field of the of the working relations and also the mass exodus of people from russia also in, involved the uh, working relations and workplaces and also mobilization of people who are in the working age and so and we are following the monitoring of these teams yeah because the economy is not uh, exactly going the way that was uh, forecasted but also the system like it's now existing, it's no way that it can be stable. And we have to be prepared for some unexpected events and not uh, to lose our focus. And we have to maintain the contacts with people with different regions who are not connected to various um, existing protest initiatives. And to, we have to, to grow this social base and also to spread the uh, this general idea in the anti-war movement that the working places, they are a very important aspect of the struggle. Okay, yeah, this was all from me. Uh, I would actually ask now if Sasha had some comments also, and then we can get some questions. Okay, thank you for all the information and uh, thank you for all that you are doing and I, hope, uh, I wish you all the resilience and courage uh, now and in the future uh, but as a person here in Finland I would like to know how we can help and support the, the struggles the anti-war struggles and activists in Russia thank you спасибо mm. It's a very simple answer. As far as the feminist anti-war movement goes, in feminist anti-war movement, it's many people who are not in Russia. I also am not in the Russia right now. I wouldn't sit be here with my face if I was in Russia. And if you want to help, you can write the contact of the Telegram canal. There is answering machine and can ask what to do and also propose concrete things and also ask if we have uh, some group in uh, Helsinki or somewhere in Finland and we have also some people right now in Finland it's always possible to join us and to help us in our work and to connect us and this way we can we can meet and work together so we think it's also important to spread information about various protest initiatives in Russia because so there is also now kind of in many medias they are spreading ideas that there is no no any kind of resistance now going on in Russia and there is also a message that there is some sort of consensus in Russia of people supporting the war and it's uh, but actually there is quite a lot of different attempts to avoid the mobilization so i think it's uh, quite uh, and in general it's uh, apparently around one third of the society doesn't like the war and is against it and uh, these people who are in the, some sort of danger 
they also need uh, who are joining the protest and get into trouble they also need uh, su support so we are actually now running out of time of the first discussion and and uh, sasha is also talking in the second presentation we will start soon uh, discussion on anti-war prisoners and what to support for them and probably i think sasha would need a break for this so we need uh, to have a 15 minutes break and we can continue in 15 minutes thank you yeah okay